On this week's episode, we talk to Mrs. Amanda Johnston. She's not only pioneering a new leadership style in empowering her people, but she's also innovating in curriculum, technology, and leadership for not just herself, but the entire Catholic school community. Hey, and welcome to another episode of the SMA Audio Experience Podcast. This week, we're joined by a special guest all the way from the North County in San Diego, California. Um, And we're joined by none other than the amazing principal, Mrs. Amanda Johnston. Mrs. Johnston, thanks so much for joining the call. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about our school. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, thanks for um, taking our invitation. And, you know, we, we had a, as we spoke to you a little bit through, through Twitter, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we're, we're glad that you're feeling better. So uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, we, we wanted it. Yeah. I have a little bit of residual cough. Oh, you do. Okay. Well, Hey, you're, you're probably better off now than you were a week ago. So absolutely, you know, we're, we're happy for that. <laughs> um, we, we wanted to go over a couple of topics uh, as we, you know, when we reached out to you earlier and, we really wanted to hear, you know, how you're doing things and the success, successes you're having at your school, like in the in the areas of of STEM, um, blended learning, um, empowering your your staff and your teachers, you know, from a leadership perspective. So, uh, a couple of you know, that's what we wanted to go over, you know, with you because we really think that can add a lot of value to you know the listeners um, who you know who are listening to this from your community and also from our com- community and the Catholic school community in a whole. One of the things we wanted to get started with was uh, our first question is, what's a top principal moment that happened this month between you and your teachers or, you know, you and your student leaders that that you'd love to share with everybody? Oh, that's so hard. Um, There's so many great successes happening here. You know, last year was my first year as principal. And so we sat back and we kind of looked at what the school was doing doing and conducted a needs assessment and talking to parents, teachers, uh, other staff, and even the students thinking about, well, where do we need to go? Where do we want to go? We had this open slate and we wanted to figure out what's going to be best to maximize student learning. And so in doing that, we started um, started to create kind of a vision, a little bit of a dream for the school. And if you would have told me we'd be where we are right now, then I, I would have never believed you. This has really taken a uh, flight and we've been so blessed with so many experiences that um, I didn't realize would be able to we'd be able to pan together this quickly. And so we're really, really fortunate. And so in that, um, I guess the best success um, in this month uh, would have to be, we um, embarked, we really decided to put a focus on the sciences. And so really understanding what those next generation science standards mean and how to teach them really well. It's one thing to just, you know, cover the concepts but for you to create those experiences for those students, and that's really what it's about, is not just being able to recite important facts about science. It's about applying the skills that you're learning and, uh, into different scenarios. And so we really wanted to make sure that when we, when we took that leap, we were doing it correctly. And so in order to do that, we just decided that we're going to bring in the best. And so in, in um, the way that fate would have it, I was able to um, develop some partnerships with some key people. And so in terms of the sciences, we've been focusing with um, Dr. Anita Crady, and she's been coming onto our campus um, since the beginning of the school year, working one-on-one with one of my teachers. Um, That way that could be the teacher leader in NGSS. And uh, that's been really great and instrumental. But what was most exciting this past month is that our my whole staff got to go through their first professional development day with her and it was a half day we finished school off and then we then we met from one to four and the meeting was over at four but we ended up even staying around longer just because of the excitement and the buzz in the room it's really a taking a big leap in a different direction and so our teachers really had to be ready to let go of what they've been doing in the past to move forward with what's to come in the future. And um, the embracement that they did was just um, so profound. I wasn't sure how it was going to be, you know, whenever you implement something new and when something's different than what you've been used to be doing and 
it, it can be a little bit scary. And I know that they were a little hesitant at the beginning of the meeting, but you can tell that they just want to do what's best for the students and that, that they're ready. And I think that because we have that support system in place with um, not just saying, okay, go do this, but backing it up with the help needed to, um, to make it run successfully has been really crucial. And so just being in that room and getting to experience it with my staff and, and seeing those light bulb moments with them um, was probably the best thing that happened to me this month as principal. That's amazing. And you, you touched on something I wanted to, to um, you know, just uh, go dive in more detail in that frame, framework of support. And you mentioned, you know, um, you know, being in the new position from a, a principal and point of view, obviously, you know, you being in being a teacher of how, you know, years of experience prior to that. Um, how has the support system for you as a principal been from the, you know, the diet, the office of schools and, and the other fellow principals in the San Diego Catholic school system. How has that been for you navigating, you know, this, this new change in addition to getting acclimated to your new role? How's that been? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, I can't speak enough about this whole experience. Um, I came in to the role of principal a little bit late in the summer of 2016. And so uh, I didn't, I started the summer thinking I was going to be the third grade teacher here at St. Mary. And then things, you know, God had a different plan and John Galvan ended up calling me up and asking me if I'd be interested in taking it on as interim, in which I prayed about and ultimately decided, yes, I wanted to serve the school community that I love so much in whatever capacity they thought best fit. And so I took that leap and, um, and we um, had a kind of like a, I don't know how much you know about St. Mary's School, but we were the first elementary school to become a diocesan elementary school, whereas um, where they're all connected with the diocese, um, the pastor of St. Mary Parish is not the superintendent here. The superintendent would be John Galvan, um, the director in the office for schools. And so um, our support system is probably a little bit different, but they really um, identified that I was going to need a little bit of help navigating this and getting started with all the changes and everything that was going on. And so um, John Galvan appointed Matthew Cordes, who I know you had on the podcast, I think last week, um, to kind of help me. And he's been so instrumental in um, helping me dream bigger for the school and, you know, just being that support system of someone to be able to bounce ideas off of. And I've really grown as a leader because of him. And I've told him that before. And I, and I will tell anyone like I have grown so much this past year because of him and the supports that he's provided um, and the diocese. So the diocese uh, also uh, assigned us a mentor uh, principal. And so I have um, Kathy Mock as mine. She's over at St. Michael's in Poway. And she's just so efficient and great at what she does. So to be able to get questions answered by her um, has been fabulous. And I kind of had to learn really quickly on that. I just couldn't be afraid to ask questions because if I didn't know the answer and I was trying to get by, I wasn't mm -hmm. doing the best for my community. And so I just learned that um, making connections was really important, and so I really strive to make connections with all the different principals in the diocese, um, mostly the ones that are closer to me just because we meet, but whoever, and I'm not afraid to ask questions, so I'll, if, you know, if I know someone's doing something great, I'll go talk to them about it, and so I think that that's been, that's been really huge for us, and, you know, while the parish is no longer um, the superintendent of the school, we have a really supportive pastor of Catholic education. So he's still our spiritual leader and he still promotes our school and he's still there to support me in any way that I can. So I'm just blessed by a variety of support. That's amazing. And, you know, that's a, a very important point because I know there's another podcast, you know, that I listen to and I know a lot of people listen to, you know, with, um, I think it's Catholic School Matters, you know, with, um, with, with that podcast. And, you know, it was great, great series. I got over like a hundred episodes and, you know, I was listening to um, a couple of them, you know, with new schools and also with, you know, uh, turnaround schools. He, he did a ter turnaround series as well. Um, but in either case, leadership, right. You know, leadership um, from the support system and the gr uh, grow growing a person into a leader, uh, irregardless of the years of experience. Um, you know, I think is one of those cornerstones that so many of these uh, these thriving, you know, Catholic schools in all 
in all parts of the United States, even in California and other states, are, are seeing resurgence is because of just going back to those basics of leadership, right? You know, you kind of echo that in your answer of having that right support system, um, not being afraid to, you know, to ask questions, you know, peer, you know, uh, buddying up or partnering with a mentor, all of those fundamentals that so many people hear in different uh, verticals, like whether you be in, in, in medicine, uh, technology, um, education, law, you know, city government, et cetera, all those fundamentals are universal. And I think that um, you guys are, through the curriculum and through your environment are actually um, being able to apply those and show those not only amongst yourselves, but amongst your students, you know, and I think that's, that's one of those things that these skills that you guys are, um, you know, exploring and it's, it's great. It's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah. Know. And a couple additional things that I also don't want to make sure I don't forget to mention is that um, they also started in the diocese in your first and your second year. There's a, it's their first year you meet with Matthew Cordes, who's in charge of just leadership in general over at the diocese in a cluster with new principals that first year. And so you meet and you collaborate with them, which is great because you're getting the guidance that you need from the diocese, but you're also in it with other people who are experiencing the same feelings that you might be experiencing. And so that's been great. But the second part about that that's fantastic is we were also assigned a principal coach and so we've, I've had two principal coaches that have both helped me so much I meet them I meet with them once a month and so it's been really great in the first year um, in the first year we targeted community and building that up and just regular day-to-day -day operations and in the second year I'm paired with a new um, former principal who just ran a school so well and was able to keep costs low but still educate um, still educate those kids to the maximum potential. And so it's, I've had really valuable insights along the way. And I'm also just not afraid to take other opportunities on. And so um, I know you had Leslie on here uh, a couple weeks ago. And so I'm actually, I travel up to LA once a month to attend um, something with the CSC where it's on leadership. And so it's a bunch of principals in a room that are covering a variety of topics most recently. Um, they've added a component on budgeting and different things like that. So I'm able to get that support that I need in those areas and grow. You know, we want our students to continue to grow. We want our teachers to continue to grow, but I think it's really important as principals that we also continue to grow. That's perfect. And, you know, that comes from the top down, right? You know, every, everybody's, um, you know, should have that universal, um, you know, driving factor, that motivation to grow, you know, everything from everybody from the top down, right? Every, everyone mm -hmm. from the leader Absolutely. all the way down. That's amazing. Um, one of the things I want to jump into is, you know, uh, obviously you introduced, you know, some, some new strategies and, and curriculum or, you know, topics that haven't really been um, used, you know, properly yet, um, or a better word for that. Um, can you kind of go into the unique obstacles of what you, what you've been trying to implement over the last couple of years um, in what, what are some of those obstacles and also have you been able to go through them? Are they still present? Um, you know, what, what are, what are those growing pains that you've gone through as a principal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the biggest, the biggest initiative, the biggest thing that we've pushed forward um, this year is that we implemented the blended learning model. And so that comes, um, it's such a great thing, but it comes with its own unique challenge, especially trying to get it off the ground. And so I'll back up a little bit and just talk about a little bit about what blended learning is. Um, what it is, is it's a way for us to personalize learning to meet the individual needs of our students. And so we recognized that not every student learns the same way and that not every student's at the same level. They all have their areas of strength and their areas of needs. And so what would be the best way for us to be able to identify and help each child? And so um, in working with Matthew, who has experience over in the Diocese of San Jose, um, and he was very experienced with blended learning, he suggested that we consider it. And it was something we had kind of talked about maybe taking on a few years ago, um, but we didn't really quite implement it, we had um, instead just added the technology. And so what blended learning does is there is a technology piece. And so um, it sometimes gets confused with the technology integration by, you know, oh, we added technology into the classroom and we have some lessons 
on the devices. So we're blended learning. That's not really what it is. That's, that's adding the technology, which is a great component of blended learning, but blended learning is so much more. What, what you do is the technology allows you to um, enhance the learning in a way um, that's really um, specific to the needs of the student. And so what happens is, is that we tend to do like a station rotate. We do a couple different versions of it, but we do a station rotation. And that's kind of what's going to be coming down the pipeline K to eight, where um, students um, will have small group individualized instruction based on the individual, like in identified needs from the teacher, where they can work directly with the teacher. And then we have another group working on the, on the, devices, whether it be a laptop or an iPad, and um, they're working on adaptive curriculum. And what that does is it meets them exactly at their need, where they are at in language arts and math. And so that way they can be targeting, working on those skills. And then from there, um, the best part about that is that all those software is collecting data. And then that data, the teacher then has to be able to determine what where she needs to go next. So it's gone are the days of having to, um, you know, give an assessment to the whole class and then collect it back and you know how, when, however long it takes you to grade then you identify those problems and you try and combat it it's instantaneous and um, and I think that it allows us to really know where we need to go and it allows us to it allows us to look at is this program working and um, there's kind of another component too where they might be doing independent work or project-based learning and so we're still in the beginning stages so it's not we're not fully blended learning yet you know we're we're getting there and more and more components every day, but it's about building towards that because there's just so many components um, that it has to offer. And so it's about taking the necessary steps and moving it, moving it at the pace that the students can handle, but also making sure that as we do it, we're doing it right, not just adding technology to add technology. Um, and that's been, that's been the biggest thing for us. In terms of the actual hurdles, um, it's a mind shift it's a mindset shift. And so it, we've had to, we've had to change our mindsets as educators. You know, the parents have had to change their mindsets of what a Catholic classroom looks like, because you're not going to have all the desks faced at, um, at, you know, at the board with, you know, the teacher in the front of the room doing all the talking and then, you know, kid completely completing a worksheet. What it is, is it, it looks really different. You come in, you might see, you might see a lot of conversations going on in one section, teachers working um, with students in another section and other kids on the computer. And so it's just been a mind shift switch. And so I think that that, that, was, that was one of our hurdles, I think for sure. And then, you know, we're functioning out of a building that's over 60 years old. And so, you know, we, we're, we're trying to figure out, well, when we're adding the Wi-Fi, you know, we're going into brick instead of, you know, into walls and things like that. And so making sure our Wi-Fi was up to par um, we don't have a dedicated tech IT person on campus, and so um, when problems arise, it falls, you know, we all wear a lot of hats here. I have a rock star staff that's willing to pick up any pieces wherever they can, and so there's a few of us that tend to be a little bit better with the tech, and so um, we, try to, we try to problem solve, and so that's, that's kind of another thing is that you know, you, you, you kind of plan out as much and you try and learn from as many people that have done it before you, but every school is unique. And so we knew that on day one, when the laptops came out, that we were probably going to have problems because we had never tested our Wi-Fi that way, but we had called and made sure our Wi-Fi was higher before we started it. And yeah, we still had a couple problems, but it wasn't the same way that it would have been if we just decided to start without um, really investigating what our infrastructure was like. But I mean, we can still improve on our infrastructure, especially as we continue to add more devices down. With the blended learning, we're doing it in grades five through eight right now. And then in next year, it'll be K-8. And so um, we're already starting to make those plans. And the nice part about piloting is that we've kind of learned from some of our mistakes. So that way we can um, that way we can make sure that we don't continue to make those mistakes as we implement it down in the lower grades. But, you know, I think, I think mistakes are important and it's not so much about, um, you know, like what it's, what do you do when that mistake happens? It's, do you just keep going at it or do you pivot? And so what we've just had to learn to do is pivot, change direction, get ready to go, make whatever necessary changes that we need to do to do it. We don't just stay still. And I think that's been crucial. And so the learning experience, um, the curve has been a really fast one for us. And so we're just, we're just taking it as it comes and 
learning along the way and just evaluating the program. I'm out there talking to the students, to the parents, to the teachers. What do you like about this? What do you think we can improve upon? Um, you know, all those things are important aspects. And, you know, I would expect to hear from the kids that, oh, we're excited because now we get to play on the computers. And so, you know, I asked that question recently up in the middle school to the eighth graders. And they were like, you know, what we really like about it is that, first of all, we get to work at our, we get to work where we're at, you know, and so it, and there are supports in there that can help us, our teachers can help us, but we get to work where we're at. And then what's great is that it becomes a continuation of the day because we went one to one with devices in grades five through eight, and we actually decided to let them bring them home. And so they might start working on something on their computer in class, and then they don't have to worry about saving it to a flash drive and then bringing the flash drive home and you know all that stuff and making sure that everything's saved. It's on their device that's at home, at school with them. You know, their education is at their fingertips at all times. Uh, but I really wanted to make sure that I also say, I've been talking a lot about the tech. I wanna make sure that we're really clear about this, that it's not replacing good teaching. You know, at the end of the day, those teachers, we cannot replace. They are the ones that are really pulling it all together and tying it in. It's that targeted um, small group work that's really the, what's making the difference. It's just that the tech's allowing us to identify it faster and to help them quicker and to help us identify, well, where can we challenge them a little bit more and, or where do we need to support them? And so I think, um, I think that is something that we have to do is like when people automatically hear that text there or that we're blended learning, they assume that the kids are in front of the computers all day and that's not the case. It's just supporting the good teaching that's already happening here. That, oh, that's amazing. And I'm, I'm surprised that, uh, what is that? You guys don't have a side fundraiser of like selling leadership course. Cause I mean, what you just said right there, I mean, you could bundle that up and, you know, sell that, you know, for fundraising. So that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Um, so very, very the last issue I want to make sure I say one more thing is the funding. Um, mm -hmm. It's expensive to get it started. I mean, in terms of what we can do with it, it ends up being, it can be cost effective in the long run, but getting it started was hard. And we were really lucky that we got some donations from a couple of different people in the amount of, you know, $37,000 that we were able to invest in this this year. And so, and rather, so that's, in the tech, but more importantly, that's on the professional development to support the teachers. We didn't just say, go do blended learning. We sent them to trainings at Santa Clara University and at Loyola Marymount University, and we have a blended learning coach that comes out, um, I think she's coming out like six or eight times this year to support to observe the teachers, to support them, but she's available. I mean, I talk to her all the time. And so I think, um, I think that the investment, um, the investment in our teachers was really crucial in helping make this successful as well. I couldn't have said it, said it better myself. I mean, in as much, we all know technology moves so fast and at such a crazy rate uh, that investing in people is one of those tried and true things where if, if you have people, you, you know, you've sold them, you sold them and you got them bought in a hundred percent on the vision and the course of where you're taking the school and where, you know, the, the roles that they can play, the crucial roles that they can play, you know, on, on the team and the whole for that, for the greater good of, of the student and their families, um, you know, finding, finding those. Cause we, we know, you know, like every school is different and, you know, some schools may not be able to find that, but I think some of those nuggets that you had in, in what you were stating is still never give up, you know, like you may mm -hmm. not be able to find, $30,000, $37,000, but Hey, can you start with making a thousand dollars, $2,000, you know, can, can you work, can you work your way up there? Can you build partnerships that everybody can do, you know, um, absolutely. Every, everyone can do that. You know, there's no reason to say I can't do that. Um, because that echoes back to that main point that you said was number one, before anything that you see out in front of you, it all starts in your mind, right? It's that mindset mm -hmm. shift. You know, that was that, that key a turning point um, that you realized, you know, from a, from a principal and a leadership point of view. Uh, but that's one of those things that, Hey, aside from, you know, the latest iPad or the latest adaptive software that you're using, you know, it's, well, what is my intention and mindset shift of what can, can my team do with these tools and how, you know, how can we orchestrate this into a better recipe than, you know, last year and make it better this year.
Absolutely. I mean, in doing my research, I've heard people start this program with a lot less um, money too. We just got lucky that it came in at the right time for us, but we would have started it. We would have started it with whatever we had to scrape together to make it work. It was, it was always, we knew this was the way it was going to happen. We were just, it just, we just got blessed, I guess. That's going to go ahead and lead into this. You know, the, the final question I had is it, it's a good summary. Uh, can you name an instance where empowering a teacher or a staff member worked really well and what feedback did that person provide you? Well, I, um, with moving forward with blended learning and NGSS, there were a lot of different things that kind of happened. And so because we were um, focusing this on the middle school and because we were still working under a budget for this, we were only able to send um, our middle school teachers to get the training for blended learning um, last summer. And so in talking to some of the other teachers, one in particular, I really identified that it seemed like she really was like yearning for more. And so she didn't get to go, but she was, you could tell she was um, bummed that, you know, she was happy for her other co-workers that they got this opportunity but she was you know I could tell she had wished that she was able to also go through with this and so when the next opportunity arose where we could do um, where I needed to identify somebody in science to um, kind of take over and be our science coach she was initially the first person that I thought of was because I was like she wants more and I wasn't able to give it to her with blended learning but this would be something that would really suit her well. She had been our kindergarten teacher before, so she had taught science at the kindergarten level. She had taught a multiple age classroom of fourth and fifth graders, and she had experience teaching science in the middle school. So in terms of being that leader on campus, not only um, did she want more, but she really possessed the qualities that could understand the different plights of our teachers. Being a single, single grade level school, you know, it's sometimes hard when you don't have another third grade teacher, but because Emily had experience across those ways, she seemed like the logical one. And I honestly, when I, when I made the pairing, I knew it was gonna be good. I just didn't realize like how fast Emily would be able to turn things around in her classroom um, and the impact it would have beyond the science you know, beyond science class. And so she started working one-on-one -on -one with Anita and Anita would come in and observe her and provide pointers and give her that coaching support. And um, it was a really mm -hmm. great relationship right out of the gate, um, a lot of trust. And um, when a teacher wants to grow and is open, it's really easy to see that. And so we most recently, I most recently went in the last time Anita was there and watching the kids um, in their science class was just, astounding. Um, we had seen a total flip from, we had seen a total flip from the students um, sitting at desks, maybe in groups doing group work, but really being like led by the teacher, instructed by the teacher and everything like that, to seeing the students exploring and then the teacher just facilitating and, you know, asking them to expand upon and then the teacher kind of coming in with the answer at the end, you know, or the conversation because with science there's not always 100% a right answer. And so it's, they are learning through exploration and they're, they're the ones steering the ship. And I think, um, I, you know, you hear about it all the time, but until you see the impact that it has on student ability and performance, it's, um, you know, you really don't understand it until you get to see it. And so when I saw that, I was blown away. Like the progress that had been made from, I think the first time she got observed was in October until January, like I mm -hmm. couldn't believe the change in the students because when you're switching a culture, when you're making a shift like that, that's so um, big for those kids, especially at the fourth grade level, they've been experiencing, you know, science a certain way for a number of years. For them to make that shift so quickly um, was just further proof that this is exactly where we need to keep going. And what I love most about what Emily has done is that it doesn't limit to just science class now. So now she's thinking about, well, what can I do to make my math program more student-led? And what can I do to do this in English language arts? And so I think that, um, you know, we knew the fruits were gonna be in the, in, in the science class, but the impact that it's had across the board. And I think also just the teachers, it's fanning the flame with some of my other teachers, like they're excited about what's to come. And so for them, and so I think that that's been great, but really in my conversations, talking back to Emily, it's come down to her just being like, you know, thank you for identifying that 
this skill in me because I think that if you would have asked Emily if she felt like she was a leader, she automatically assumed that she wasn't because she's a little bit more soft-spoken, you know, not quite as outgoing, but she has so many strengths within her. And I think that I've seen like, I've just seen her blossom in front of my eyes. And I think that she um, has identified that in herself. Like she has been a really true leader over here on our campus. And I think that it's kind of reignited a passion for her, for her education and for her teaching, just because I think that um, she's always been great at what she does. It's just that it's when something new is coming, it's just exciting again. And to see the growth in the kids, I think that just keeps you going. You know, it's not easy work what she's doing. She has to work, you know, extra hard, but it's so worth it. And, you know, she's saying she hasn't had this much fun in so long, you know. So I think um, I think it's really great to, like, spread out the leadership. So now I'm like, well, what are we going to do to give more of my teachers this opportunity, that dispersed leadership model of let's create a bunch of leaders on here and let's utilize everyone to their strengths. Amazing. And, you know, that, that was the, the big thing in reaching out to you because, you know, studying from afar, you know, just looking at the news, um, you know, looking at newsletters, um, social media, the internet, uh, just word of mouth and everything like that. Um, there was a lot of great things that we were hearing from your school, you know, at St. Mary's in Escondido. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things you guys, you know, you guys came and you um, also came, you know, as a recommendation of, you know, go check out what they're doing because we think a lot of schools can, can take some of the nuggets and some of the, the lessons that they're learning and they're experiencing on the fly and, you know, that they recently experienced and apply it to, you know, their own unique schools and communities to, you know, to raise their bar of what they're trying to do, you know, to help accomplish their goals. Um, I mean, the, the answers and the effort, the insight that you've been able to provide is great. You know, just, showing such variety of, you know, the blending of, uh, and learning of leadership style, uh, connecting with your community, your peer, your, your parents, uh, staff and, and team members, uh, in addition to other leaders, amazing. And the, the big thing where I think he summed it up great, which is a, a really important trait for, for leadership and even just team members and individuals, um, all the way from parents, students and staff members, uh, and everyone in, in our faith community is self-awareness of self right you know mm -hmm. self-awareness of like a, you, you had a really good point I'm going to rewind there is that part where you said hey if if I asked Emily if she thought she were a leader initially she might say no because that's may, her personality is maybe a little more um, softer spoken um, maybe not as outgoing you said but what a lot of people forget and um, and you, you, you may see it like in with the students in different grades um, not uh, leaders aren't one way right great leaders aren't just come out of one cookie cutter box and that's the the thing that i think to to inspire people who are listening to this is that each one of us has leadership qualities and we have our strengths and and our needs to to work on but if you can double down on on working on those strengths and partnering up with people that can help uh, fill in the areas where you're not as strong um that just that can just promote higher self awareness for everybody, you know, and that that's what we what I've been able to take after you know hearing the turnaround um, that you guys have been able to do over at St. Mary Escondido is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that um, one of our a big part of our vision for the school is about creating um, developing leaders, and if we want to develop leaders, we need to show leadership across the board. It can't just be the principal you know, is the leader. I want everyone to be leaders and I want our students to be leaders on campus too. What can we do on the campus level to um, allow those leadership opportunities across all grade levels, not just with the eighth grade or with student council, but just across the board, providing those opportunities um, helps them know. I think that I also, I would have never thought that I'd be a principal if you would have asked me when I was in elementary school. No way, you know, some that's for somebody else. And so I think that the more, the more that we can teach them that and show that to them and demonstrate that everyone's a leader no matter what their personality or you know I think that's just the biggest thing that we can do for our students and I think that why wouldn't you utilize the um, everyone to their strengths you know I'm not I'm not the best at every single thing so let's just find people that have different skill sets and then utilize their skills for the betterment of the school and our students.
Oh, yes. I just also wanted to say that, you know, what we're doing here is newer for our diocese. And so what I'm constantly thinking about is, well, then how do we share the experiences and the opportunities that we have been given with other people? And so absolutely, like as we build out our program more and it's more solidified, I am a big believer in share, share your gifts. And so whatever we can do to help other schools take off with this, if that's something that they're interested in, um, we'll be happy to support them in that journey. That's amazing. And that's the one thing I wanted to, and you, you're going to, you segue, pro, you know, like amazingly into that. I was going to ask you, you know, with you, you ended the, you know, the conversation on such a great note um, with a super core nugget that everyone can take action on, you know, right away is, you know, that mindset shift of seeing themselves as a leader, regardless of whatever their strengths and, and, you know, um, needs are etc. Um, I wanted to um, make sure everyone knows where can they reach out to, to you and your school? Where, where can we find you on the internet, social media? What's the best way to reach out to you and your team and your school? Absolutely. Um, well, we are on pretty much all the social media channels. Um, I think the easiest way to reach out to us would probably be via Twitter. And so um, the school Twitter handle is at S.P. Mary Escondido. And um, if you're interested in connecting with me to ask questions about what we were doing, um, you can find me there as well on Twitter. I'm on, at, at SMS Mrs. Johnston with a T. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, like I said, I'm one that I'm not, I always ask questions, so I'm always going to be willing to share answers as well. And so I think that, you know, any kind of collaboration makes everyone better. And so those are the, those are the two ones. I mean, we're also on Facebook and um, Instagram, so you can find us there. That's really cool because you can see, you can kind of start to see some of the stuff that we're doing. But anyone who's interested in, you know, coming to take a look at that school, you know, other teachers, principals, anything like that, come take a look. Yeah, call me. Let's, let's set up a time so you can come see in action what's going on here. Perfect. Amazing. Well, everybody, there you have it. We've, uh, e there's even more resources available to you. So um, if you're out of school, if you're a principal, a teacher, administrator, a pastor, associate pastor, a parent, um, you know, use this information. So even if you're not in San Diego County if, and you're not in Los Angeles County, maybe you're on the, uh, on the East Coast. If you're hearing this, reach out. We, you know, we're um, trying to make these resources available because amazing leaders are doing amazing things here. And it would be, um, you know, it's the, the best thing that we can do is, as Mrs. Johnson said, share the great things that we're doing and just bring everybody up. So with that, that concludes another episode of the SMA Audio Experience Podcast. Listen to us next week. Thanks for now. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the SMA Audio Experience podcast brought to you by St. Michael San Diego's technology and social media team. For more information, go ahead and visit our website at www.smasandiego.org. On Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, we use the common handle or username of SMA San Diego. So you can definitely reach out to us there. Leave a tweet, a message, a post, a comment. Uh, we'll be happy to engage with you, answer all your questions, and really join in part of sharing the St. Michael San Diego story on social media and on the internet and also via the podcast. So thanks again for listening. Take care, and we'll hear you next week.